<clears throat> okay, so I'm going to start off with just a general overview of the chant history, which is probably going to end up being broken into two sections. We'll probably get through half the first half tonight and do the second half next Monday. We'll see how it goes. Um, <clears throat> but also, it's the first time I've ever done any kind of. Uh, presentation thing like this before, so go easy on me. <laughs> um, Always like a good teacher. So first of all, <coughs> in your mind, put yourself 2,000 years back into um, the Middle East, the time of the Apostles. And the apostles and disciples after Pentecost, uh, with the um, the Jewish liturgies being fulfilled now, of course. The apostles and the disciples leave the holy city of Jerusalem and the lands of Syria and Palestine, and Christianity spreads rapidly throughout all the Mediterranean basin. <clears throat> um, as the gospel spread, so to the practice of worship. The liturgy was being developed. <clears throat> During this time, and for the first few centuries after Christ, there was no central organization, uh, in the sense that we have it today, and each region was celebrating the liturgy, and therefore singing it in its own language. Even in Rome, the, uh, the language of the liturgy was actually in Greek. <clears throat> Thus the church in Jerusalem was celebrating in Hebrew, Antioch and Syria were celebrating in Syriac, Egypt with Alexandria in the Coptic language, etc. This diversity of language has been maintained up to the present day in the Eastern liturgies, but gradually over the first two centuries of the Church in the Western Mediterranean, the liturgy became dominated by Greek. But in the third century, in the 200s, Latin, the language of everyday life in Rome, gradually started to become the dominant liturgical language. In the West, every, regi every region began to have its own repertoire of Latin hymns and chants, but each with different texts and music according to their culture. As in Spain, there was the Spanish rite, the Mothadovic, um, with its chants, which uh, today the Mothadovic rite um, only exists in the city of Toledo. Um, <clears throat> and however, all of its original chants have been completely lost. We, we have uh, a couple of manuscripts, we have absolutely no idea what it sounded like, unfortunately. <clears throat> um, a Roman rite with Roman chants, Beneventan chant in southern Italy, <clears throat> Milanese or Ambrosian chant in Milan, and one or perhaps several types of Gallican chant in the lands of Roman Gaul. France, Switzerland, and Belgium. All of these ancient Western rites, of all of these ancient Western rites, uh, only two remain to, the, to this day. The Spanish Mothadovic rite, which used to be all over Spain, is now restricted to Toledo, and the <clears throat> uh, Milanese or Ambrosian rite in Milan taking its name from St. Ambrose. <clears throat> the Milanese or Ambrosian rite, we do have the chant from that, uh, and it remained, uh, the music of which remained unwritten until the 12th century. But there comes a question, why sing? In ancient times, on a spiritual level, it was inconceivable to publicly proclaim the Word of God by merely speaking it. The Divine Word of God was and is too holy to merely speak. It must be sung. Its dignity demands nothing less than this. On a practical level, in a time when uh, microphones and speakers were non-existent, uh, singing the text, or rather a solemn declamation in the early centuries, reciting on one or two tones with minor lifts and falls on the accents and ends of phrases. This aided in the vocal projection of the text. 
from an artistic view, it added an extra level of dignity beyond that of the spoken word. <clears throat> However, in the first four centuries of the church, when it was suffering persecutions, the ability to build churches and to elaborate the liturgy and chant was very restricted. Therefore, the chant was also restricted to a solemn declamation with very little modification and ornamentation until the 5th and 6th centuries when the so-called Dark Ages came to an end. Um, as we'll see later on, how um, church architecture, the music of the liturgy, the liturgy itself, they're all deeply connected and related to another. If one of them changes, it affects the others. As Christianity spread from the Middle East across Europe and Africa, the apostles and disciples took with them their traditions from the Middle East of chanting the Psalms and other prayers. But each country they visited also had their own musical traditions. As these new apostolates were converted to Christianity, they would naturally sing the Psalms and other prayers according to their own musical traditions, no doubt affected to some small degree by the Middle Eastern traditions that the disciples brought with them. In Europe, a change from Greek to Latin would also naturally affect musical composition. Keeping in mind that musical notation does not exist in these early centuries. Everything is an oral tradition. Everything's memorized. As for the ancient liturgy in Rome, we are well informed with how the liturgy was celebrated in these early centuries through various liturgical books, such as the Sacramentary, which is um, the book for the celebrants containing the collects, prefaces, etc., throughout the year, and other rubrical books of that time. Um, the chant, on the other hand, remains unknown to us until the 11th century. This is specifically the, the Roman chant, remains unknown until the 11th century, when the first book of Roman chant appears, because like the Ambrosian chant, and all others, it was passed on by oral transmission. Five books, dating from between the 11th and 13th centuries, have brought us the repertory as it was sung in certain Roman basilicas of that time. And even if there were any distortion or corruption, this must have been minimal because there are very few uh, variant readings between the five manuscripts. These sources make it possible for us to recapture, to a large extent, the tradition of the old Roman chant. This is a pantheon in Rome. Originally built, of course, as a pagan temple for pagan liturgies, pagan chants, everything pagan. But then, um, around the, I believe it was the 6th century or 7th century, it was turned over to the Christians and Catholics and has been a Catholic. Uh, church ever since. Um, in essence, the composition of the Roman repertory dates from the 5th to 6th centuries, so around the time that this was turned over to the Christians. Uh, not only had the church been free of persecution since the 4th century, but even the administrative structure of the Roman Empire seems to have been adopted by the church. The ending of the persecutions allowed for the freedom of public worship, which then led to the building of great basilicas, which called for a more elegant and elaborate liturgy, which called for more ornate music. The evolution and elaboration of any one of these affects the others as well. Aside from the five old Roman chant manuscripts from the 11th to 13th centuries, there is also uh, there is another non-musical manuscript from the 7th century which tells us uh, a little about how the music was sung. It says there were two voices, cantor singing the melody and another set of voices singing a bass line below, which is most probably what we refer to today as an e-song, a drone, singing a structural note underneath the melody. Here's another interesting photo catacomb, painting of the catacomb from the 4th century. You can see, imagine having mass in there, what kind of 
sound space that would be like chanting inside. You know, probably something very, very minimalistic, you know, almost like a psalm tone. They wouldn't have had that, the time or the ability to really elaborate music until the per persecutions ended and they started to build the basilicas. Up to this point in time in Rome, most of the singing had been very simple and, and the preserve of the solo cantor. Um, <clears throat> but now appears the first Scola Cantorum, perhaps established by Pope St. Gregory the Great in the 6th century, and is a group of about 20 clergy, experienced cantors and young pupils in training, who would place their competence at the service of liturgical celebration. Their purpose was essentially twofold. One, to lessen the amount of singing of the priest in order that he could devote more time to administering to the faithful. And two, to use their musical skills and competency to further, to further develop the musical repertoire. This is the order of the monos. This is what uh, the, um, the manuscript tells us somewhat about uh, how the music was sung at that time. I think that's, I think that's the one. It's kind of hard when the, uh, when the presentation is separated <laughs> from my notes. I can tell which, which one does this pertain to. <clears throat> um, so the scholar's purposes, again, were to lessen the amount of singing of the priest in order that he could devote more time to administering to the faithful, and two, to use their musical skills and competency to further develop the musical repertory in the 6th century, 500s. Between the 6th and 7th centuries, this specialized group of musicians developed a repertory of sacred music made up of two categories of pieces. The first was a revision of the existing repertory. From then on, the scola was to replace the solo cantor for the performance of certain pieces or parts of chants, but would now be given by the scola a more elaborate style and, stru and a structure of greater complexity. For example, the introits, communions, the antiphons of the graduals, alleluia, and offertories, originally sung by a solo cantor, would now be sung by the scola, but the verses of the graduals, alleluia, and offertories would remain reserved for the soloist. The second category was the composition of fresh chants, linked to the development of the spacious basilicas, which likewise demanded a more elaborate liturgy, which demanded a more elaborate chant, etc. Each aspect, architecture, liturgy, music, affects the other developing together. One example of this second category of fresh chants would have been the chant for a development in the, in the liturgy. So as the liturgy develops, they have this new element in the liturgy, and they need a new chant to accompany it. And that is a dramatic procession in the newly constructed basilicas during the solemn entry of the celebrant, the introit, which is Latin. However, this processional entrance was much more than it is today. Today we go from the sacristy around the church to the, to the front of the church and process down the main aisle, which is an extremely condensed version of the original procession, which was processing from St. John Lateran's a mile down the road to St. Mary Major's. We do this on you know, very festive occasions. And as they arrive at St. Mary Major's, and as they enter the church, there would be the introit along the way um, during the procession, you know, singing litanies and psalms and etc. But as they enter, the introit. However, it would seem that by the time St. Gregory the Great, who was Pope between 590 and 604, by the time he became Pope, the composition of the whole corpus of Roman melodies would have been already completed. In the not-so-distant past, there used to be a common misconception that Pope St. Gregory the Great composed the chant. Of course, this is not the case. 
It's possible he may have authored a sacramentary, the prayers for the celebrant, but what he did do for sure is that he gathered particular texts and set them to specific feast days throughout the year, forming a complete liturgical cycle of the year. But Gregory wasn't the first one to do this either, nor the last. About 230 years before Gregory, Pope Damasus I, uh, between 366 and 384, advised by St. Jerome, undertook the first organization of the liturgy and chant in Rome, and modeled it after the church in Jerusalem. Again, about 150 years before Gregory, Pope Leo I, between 440 and 461, Pope Leo is believed to have been the first to institute an analis cantus, a cycle of chants, chant texts for the entire year, followed by several subsequent popes making modifications to it, including Gregory and others after him as well. But the two significant ones were Pope Damasus and Pope Gregory, so it's often referred to that the, the liturgy we have today traditional rite is the continuation of the Damasian Gregorian liturgy. Uh, I want to read here um, part of um, some text taken from Monsignor Klaus Gamber's book, Reform of the Roman Liturgy, uh, because obviously we have a, a certain crisis in the church today which goes back, the origins go back several hundred years, uh, and um, what happens to the liturgy happens to the music, and what happens to the uh, buildings affects the others. So in the 8th century, um, actually, you know what, I'll get to this in just a second, so I'm going to continue with, with uh, this here. Um, during the second half of the 8th century, a rapprochement was beginning to take place between the Frankish kingdom of it looks like Pepin, it's pronounced Pepin, Pepin, Pepin the Short, he was called Pepin the Short, and his son Charlemagne, uh, and the papacy of Stephen II and his successors. This rapprochement was at first political. The papal estates in Italy were being threatened by the Germanic Lombards, and Pepin was anxious to ensure the legitimacy of his right to the throne of Gaul, France, Switzerland, Belgium. Uh, Pepin promised to protect the papal estates, and Pope Stephen II came to France with his court, renewed the consecration as king of the Franks, and made a long stay at the Abbey of Saint-Denis, just on the north border of Paris. Oh, yeah. So this is the, the Church of Saint Pierre au Nonain. I don't know how you can pronounce that. Um, originally constructed in the 4th century, uh, had some restoration in the 7th, and then the latest addition on this was in the 11th century. But this is probably what the, um, the original um, facility of Saint, um, uh, Saint Denis looked like at that time in the, in the uh, seventh, uh, 8th century, the 700s. Um, something similar in size and shape. What what we have today, uh, after it was demolished, it was rebuilt into this Gothic cathedral, which is the, the, the really the, the first uh, Gothic cathedral that inspired all of the other uh, Gothic architecture. Chris, mm -hmm. when was the church demolished? Um. That was built in the 13th century, so probably in the 1100s. I'm guessing, I, I don't know, yeah, I haven't looked that up, but I don't know exactly. Um, in any case, the events, um, these events gave Pepin a new appreciation of Roman liturgical customs. He realized that these customs could help to ensure religious unity throughout his territories and thus strengthen their political unity. He therefore commanded that the Roman liturgy be adopted throughout his kingdom. Should I read this one now? I'll continue with this for just a second. 
The introduction of the Roman liturgy had the practical result of suppressing the Gallican liturgy, or the Gallican liturgy being the liturgy of Gaul, along with the Gallican repertory of chant, and replacing it with the Roman. Uh, we can find, too, in the correspondence and chronicles of the time, several mentions of requests in Gaul for books from Rome. Books were sent and there were exchanges of cantors, uh, because obviously no musical notation uh, was in existence yet. The best that could be done was to send books, along with cantors, um, to teach them books with the text, and then the cantors to help teach them the, the, the melodies. But no written account has come down to us of what exactly happened at that moment in the middle of the 700s in Frankish Gaul between the Seine and the Rhine rivers. However, liturgists and musicologists have compared the 11th to 13th century Old Roman chant manuscripts with the 9th to 11th century Gregorian ones. Their conclusions lead to the following hypothesis, which seems highly probable. At the time of the encounter between the Gallican and the Roman repertories, some kind of cross-fertilization happened. It was a simple matter to impose the texts of the Roman chants, since they were contained in the books, but it's quite a different matter when it comes to the melodies. Two different cultures, two completely different styles of music tradition. The overall style of the Roman chant, including its modal structure, the main structural points, principal cadences, important recitations, vocalizations, this, the fundamental of the Roman chant was in general accepted by the Gallican musicians, but Gal the Gallicans, the Gauls, covered it over with a completely different style of ornamentation, the style that they were accustomed to. In other words, instead of a simple replacement of one by the other, the result was a hybrid that might be formulated as the following equation, Gallican plus Roman equals Gallican Roman, or Frankish Roman. A large part of the repertory shows that the Old Roman and the Frankish Roman pieces are in fact very similar. Examples can be between um, the Introit for Easter Sunday, Resurrexi, uh, both the Gregorian and the Old Roman are very similar. Uh, as well, the, the gradual hectias, um, the Alleluia, oh, what is it, the Alleluia from Christmas Day, I believe, uh, Dies Sanctificatus, melody, very similar. Um, I'll play that, I'll play a recording of one of those for you in just a second. I want to go ahead and read this part here from Klaus Gambler. He says, <clears throat> Again, this is the 8th century. Because of the political developments in the 8th century, the liturgy of St. Gregory, which had been designed specifically for a use in the churches of Rome, became the standard of liturgical worship in many other parts of the Western world, namely Gaul, because they wanted to impose the Roman liturgy, which was intended for Rome itself, and they wanted to put it all over Gaul. The Gallican rite was suppressed. The adoption by the Franks of the liturgy designed for use in Rome was a source of steadily recurring problems. The foreign Roman rite was grafted onto existing local liturgical traditions of many cities and villages. The process was never entirely successful, and there lies a great tragedy. It is also one of the root causes of the debacle of today's liturgy. I'll play a little recording now of uh, an old Roman piece. Now you have to keep in mind that this recording is by a group which they sound fantastic, but it's not really an authentic interpretation because they're taking Roman chant and it's sung by Greek Byzantine cantors in their kind of Greek Byzantine style. So you can, in a certain sense, you can say, they're doing what the Gauls did, taking the Roman chant and singing it according to their style. So, um, but I think you, you'll be able to, to hear um, some similarities here. Uh, okay. Nope, nope, wrong one. Here we go. That one. 
that's this uh, area. So, I'll play this real quick, and then I'll sing you the Gregorian version of it, so you can hear the similarities. sacramentary of the 8th century, which is, in this book, it's a mix of Gallican and Roman repertory. In nomine se... Sacrum. Okay, now that my computer's rebooted again, Someday I'll
Okay, so now to the tonnery of Saint Riquier. Not sure if there's an English equivalent to the name Riquier, maybe Richard or something. Um, the most ancient musical witness to this cross fertilization goes back to the end of the 8th century, the end of the 700s, to the tonnery of Saint Riquier, which simply indicates the first words and the mode of a few pieces in the new style of chant. An entire century would pass before chant books containing musical notation would appear. Okay. Uh, there's the Tony of Saint Riquier. You can see, um, I guess in this photo it doesn't, this photo doesn't give the, um, Musical significance. But. In the ninth century, the musical treatise Musica in Kiriadis, possibly written by Hochbald or Bordo of Cluny, of the, the Abbey of Cluny, no one really knows for sure. Um, this contains the first piece of polyphony known in the West. It's from a sequence, and it lists the first theoretic requirements for music in more than one part. However, this treatise is not creating something new, but merely explaining musical rules and theories which had already been in existence in this region for quite some time. In this record, it tells us that a simple doubling of an interval of a fourth totally destroys any sense of modality of the single line of melody. It says it must be an interval of a fifth. Whereas the performers must avoid at all costs the temptation to slow down in order to keep the parts together, which spells utter ruin to the flexibility of its rhythm. Um, for an example of what the uh, this organum, as it's called, this doubling of a fifth, what, what it sounds like, um, the wonderful recording by Dominique Vallard and his, his choir, Ensemble Guilé Binchois. Guilé Binchois was a composer in the beginning of the 1400s. Uh, and this is, this is a recording of the introit Gaudiamus. Which I think we did. Once last year. It sounds familiar, but they all do. It's that typical model one. I think this was like the first one we did. Easternish sound to it because 
listen to this here. It's an alleluia with the verse in Greek. And they have, they're singing in Eson, but it's, not, it's in two, um, two different pitches. The Eson, there's one uh, down below, and then there's a higher Eson, a fourth above that. And it just gives this really beautiful ethereal sound to it. with the, the drone and you can also all of a sudden hear the, the principal important structural notes and then the, the, the less important ornamental notes uh, are less important and you can move right through them and you go from, from structural point to structural point to structural point and some structural points are more important than others and with the drone you can get a better sense of that and then of course there's also the aesthetic of it as well but it's primarily a functional harmony Like all of the most uh, ancient liturgical chants, the new Frankish Roman chant repertory was born of the oral tradition and uh, can be clearly demonstrated by internal analysis. But at some point there must have been a break in this oral tradition. The suppression of one uh, local Gallican repertory by its replacement of a foreign one, the Frankish Roman. This imposition of a new repertory on the entire West did not go without a great deal of resistance in Gaul, in Milan, in Spain, and especially Rome itself, being the center of Christendom. All, you know, they're not going to give up their traditions and ways of doing things lightly. But two conditions helped finally bring about the success of such a revolution. One is the, um, the invention of a system of finally notating down the melodies in writing, which marks a considerable turning point in the history of music. The second is the attribution of the composition of the new chant to one of the most famous figures of Christian antiquity from Rome, Pope Gregory the Great. This attribution was made all the easier by the fact that St. Gregory supposedly authored the sacramentary in which the liturgical ordering coincided with that of the Roman antiphonary of the Mass. But more than a century had passed between the official establishment of the so-called Gregorian Sacramentary and the merger of the Roman with the Gallican chants. You can see, in a time like that, you have this new chant, and you say, oh, well, Pope St. Gregory wrote this. Oh, okay, well, we'll take it, sure. 
that would have been a lot easier in, in Gallican countries, but in Rome it, it uh, took many more centuries before uh, the old Roman chant would be uh, taken over by the new, the new Roman chant, the Gallican Franco-Roman -Gal Franco chant. The first manuscripts of musical notation date from the very end of the 9th century, and more especially from the early 10th century, as the end of the 800s, beginning of the 900s. The Cantatorium of St. Gaul is the first codex to truly introduce this new invention of musical notation. This, by the way, is very interesting. Musica Kiriadis. You can see here these signs, these symbols. These were ways in which, um, what was the name of this? It's called uh, Daisian notation, I think it was called Daisian, something like that. And they would uh, indicate the, the pitches of the music by simply rotating them 90 degrees, uh, putting them in different orders and rotating them. Uh, and that would tell you a different tone, essentially. And this is the um, uh, polyphony in two parts. Rex Celi Domine uh, Mari, Maris Undi Sonni Nice um, and he, So we got pitches going up here. I we did we did this uh, a few months ago, but uh, if we have more time we can actually do that in one of these practices. Um, this is the Cantatorium of St. Gaul from 922. This is the original first form of musical notation. I'm just looking at it, books. How the heck do you sing that? But we'll, we'll eventually look at that in greater detail and uh, learn how to read that. The composition of Bugorian chant lies within the context of a great movement of civilization, which historians have called the first Carolingian Renaissance. During this period in the 8th century, Charlemagne's kingdom of the Gauls and Franks was still primarily a barbarian race trying to establish a modern civilization. To do this, they looked to Rome and also to the ancient Greeks, and they indulged in attempting to emulate the Byzantine Empire. As a result, the new repertory immediately became the object of attention of the musicologists of the time. The theoreticians of that time noticed the Greeks had a system of categorizing their music into eight different types, and in their attempt to emulate them, they forced their type of chant, this new hybrid chant, they attempted to force these chants into rhythmic and modal categories, sometimes far removed from the truth of their original composition. These are the same men who, as early as the 9th century, at the time of at the beginning of musical notation, um, and before musical notation, um, they were to uh, sing the new melodies with syllabication and organum, both are the Gallican musical traditions, which would provide the new repertory with unforeseen developments. Mentioned some location later. <clears throat> um, this is from the Cathedral of Laon, by the way. Cantatorium of St. Gaul is from the Benedictine Abbey of St. Gaul, St. Gallen, in Switzerland. This is from the Cathedral of Laon in the northern part of France, which has a completely different style of notation. Same, the same essential chant, melody, rhythm, rhythmic science, everything, except just a completely different way of, of notating it. But Saint Gaul and Laon were the first two schools of notation to produce musical notation. They were the first and the most, uh, the, the best form of notation. 
and uh, they also produced the most amount of manuscripts. And more manuscripts from these places survived than from any of the other schools of notation. This is the intro to Rathe Cheli from the fourth Sunday of Advent. St. Gaul on top, Laon on bottom. Uh, just to give you kind of a hint here. So their notation was simply, at least for St. Gaul in any way, um, drawing the voice, the shape of the melody. St. Gaul is much cleaner and easier to read, but the Laon is a lot of times much more precise. Um, they give more indications as to um, more clues to the to the pitch and also the rhythm. How would they know like, what the what the notes like? Oral transmission. It's all memorized. So these, um, you know, there weren't thousands of copies made of this. They made one copy, and one of these codecs took years and years and years to complete. They were they were on long, thin sheets of parchment that the director would have. And he'd hold it in his hand like this, um, and especially with the um, the, the top form, the, uh, which follows the shape of the melody, um, he would simply use it as. Uh, um, before singing, he would, he would look at it to kind of get a brief, all right, okay, all right. But then he wouldn't necessarily use it while directing. And even the singers, too. I mean, there's, there's a record of, um, I forget who wrote it, but he, he has this kind of a diary journal talking about the liturgy of his time. I think it's around the, the 8th century, something like that. No, it had been later. Uh, a couple centuries later, musical notation was in existence at this point, in any case. And he talks about how the cantor goes up to the podium to sing the gradual. It's a single cantor, a single gradual. And he says he has a book in his hands, but he doesn't use it. He just goes up there with this book, and he just holds it and sings, but he doesn't use the book. So. Yeah, it's most likely he would, you know, look at it before saying, okay, all right, good, got it, you know, and then go up and do it. Um, yeah, I mean, like, for, for, I mean, that's the th also the thing about chant, is there is no specific pitch to start on. You sing how, according to your vocal range. So, you know, for instance, I, I just picked a note out of random to start there, and it turned out it was a little bit high, but... Um, <laughs> Um, where did I off? There we go. Okay, so seen from the musical point of view, actually I got a couple more here. So this one is from uh, Montpellier, which is in I think it's the south of France, the southeast of France, 10th century. Also another completely different form of notation. Montpellier, I think that's south of France as well. Here, this, this is a little bit more accurate to pitch because I think it's easier to see in this one. You have all the squiggly line notation like in the others, but then you also have this, letters. And the letters are representations of pitch. Now, the D, the E, and the D, not necessarily the pitch of D and E as we think of them today, but it was a certain pitch to them. And uh, if you know what a diatonic scale is, it fits within the diatonic scale. So that helped them give them a better idea as to the actual pitch. And this is an old Roman manuscript, taken principium from Christmas, gradual, and hallelujah. 12th century, 
the manuscript was written in the 12th century, but the chant is more from the 5th and 6th century, finally being written down. And of course, there probably was some amount of evolution in the, in the, in the chant between the 5th and the 12th century, but um, you know, who knows how much, I mean, uh, probably not, not a whole lot. When the, when the changes really started to happen is when musical notation was written. Uh, then they started experimenting all over the place. This is from Benevento, Italy. Uh, in the French on the 15th century. So now you can see... This is another thing I wanted to point out. You can see here, there's no staff lines. No staff lines. In the Old Roman, now they have one line. And this helps to give uh, a better relation of, of pitch. Dispersing over the uh, above and below the lines. And usually the line would represent one of either the do or the fa, because right below each of those is a half step. So at first there was one line, then later two lines, and then eventually, you can see here, four lines, one, two, three, four, and square notation. Kind of merging towards square notation there, getting more blockish, and then eventually they become square notes all together. Seen from the musical point of view, the second half of the Middle Ages appears as a period of intense creativity and theorizing. The earliest notations have no indication of specific pitch intervals, but only rhythmic values and agogics, variations of expression. And some of those early ones we see a little C written above some signs. It stands for celerite, which means move quickly, or a T, which stands for tenete, to hold, or an X, to wait. This gives indications of rhythm. This is clearly what was best for an orally transmitted type of music, which is essentially a vocal declamation, guided by the extreme freedom of the inflections of the words. But notation was soon required to find some way of indicating the pitches of intervals. By comparing manuscripts, one can see that this further requirement had the effect of making it impossible to maintain the delicate precision of the rhythmic signs, the natural flow. The appearance of staff lines came gradually, at first only one, and then two lines, along with clefts on the guide. Finally, they reached their zenith with the four-lined Guidonian stave, named after the Benedictine monk Guido d'Arezzo. While all this helped to expand the diffusion of the repertory and to lighten the memory load, it simultaneously restricted the notator's possibility of showing precisions of rhythm. I'm just going to go a little bit more here, and then we'll, we'll come to an end. And I'll finish the second half next week. At its birth, musical notation was intimately tied to oral transmission. Before it came into being, one sang everything from memory. For decades, while it was being elaborated, one still sang everything from heart, but the cantor had recourse to the book to prepare himself before the service. Once the system of notation was established, everyone sang with their eyes to the book. What do we do? You know, pick up music and we sing it, glue to the book. You know, you know, we have to actually be consciously aware. Oh wait, hey, I gotta, you know, stop looking at it. It's, it, it is. It's like it just magnet just sucks your eyes to the page. Especially when you, you don't have musical notation, all of a sudden now it's invented. Ooh, wow, look at that! You know? <laughs> There's notation, wow! <laughs> Eventually, the role of the memory diminished. The singer was no longer able to reproduce the original vocal articulations. He was stopped in his tracks by the inevitable inadequacy of the signs. The blessing of musical notation was also simultaneously its demise. However, the oral tradition um, did continue to flourish in spite of the shortcomings of the notation. 
just as um, pneumatic notation is what we call the, the old notation, just in all squiggly lines and without any um, staff pneumatic notation. Just as pneumatic notation was able to hold its own in certain Germanic regions until the 15th century, it's also possible that an authentic interpretation was able to continue here and there, even though the melodies had been consigned to the stave. The loss of momentum in the flow of Gregorian music caused by the fixed, restrictive points of phraseology opened up a new era of creation. before going into the subject of the decadence, and that's what we'll pick up next week. Um, about the middle of the 10th century, the Roman liturgy began to return from the Franco-Germanic lands to Italy and to Rome, but it was a liturgy which had undergone radical changes and development. This importation enta entailed supplanting the local form of the Roman liturgy by its, by its Gallicanized version, even at the very center of Christendom. However, it would only have a small effect at first, and only at the smaller churches. The great basilicas would be much more resistant to any new foreign chant, and this is evident by the five great basilicas producing their chant manuscripts from the 11th to 13th centuries. Perhaps in an effort to ensure that their old Roman chant remained, and to ward off the incoming Frankish Roman chant, it's possible. One can also imagine how the Romans of these basilicas must have felt hearing this new hybrid chant. Some probably thought it was marvelous and the perfection of their own chant. Others could have thought it was nice, but had a bias for their own Roman chant as the original. And probably others still who would have thought it a poor attempt at trying to imitate the Roman chant, a corruption of the Roman chant, and wanting nothing to do with it. The Roman scholas probably would have been uh, of the latter category, the actual skull amendment. Usually tend to be pretty stubborn. However, in the 11th century, the 1000s, there was a Benedictine monk and musical theorist named Guido D'Arezzo. Until his time, chant was still being written in nooms, flyleaf, squiggly notes, but some place had begun using square notes, but with only two line staves. It's likely, though not certain, that Guido D'Arezzo completed and perfected the stave by adding two more lines, the C and F clefts, which, by the way, do not indicate the pitch of C and F, <laughs> only that that line says, if you have a Do clef, C clef says, this line is Do, right below it is a half step. So he, he, he completed, likely, completed the, the staff, gave it the, the, the clef signs, and also the little guides at the end of, uh, end of the phrase. You see it's like a little note halfway cut off, and that tells you the first note on the next line. And this is referred to as the Guidonian stave. He also contributed with the developing of the Guidonian hand, a method of learning and practicing solfege. I think I've got a picture of that here. Uh, that's the Dodian hand. So, the Do, Re, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, I forget how it goes. I learned it at one time and then got it. <laughs> Um, and then he also, likely, it's not entirely certain, but most likely, um, came up with the names for the scale, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do, except Do was originally Ut, Ut, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, and La, it only went to La, there was no T. T was originally C, and I'll show you why comes from a hymn from the Feast of St. John the Baptist, Utque Arvaxis. 
is on the degree of the scale of which do is. Ut hoyanoxis re, do, re, is on the degree of the scale, re. Uh, so we'll say the second degree of the scale. The third degree of the scale, which is mi, is nira. The fourth degree, fa, is fa muli. Tuorum, sol, ve, oluti, la, vi, reatum, and then sante Ioannes, s, i, is what creates c. Ut que ant laxis resonare fibris mira gestorum famuli tuorum solve poluti la vire atum sante Ioannes. C, the, that degree of the scale, C, um, I think came centuries later. I uh, can't quite remember. I think it came in the like 1700s when they, when they made the, the C part. Um, and, then, um, and then later it was uh, changed to T. Ut, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si. And actually, it's some, uh, in France and Switzerland, one a lot of schools still still teach the scale according to that. Ut re mi fa sol. Oh, uh, do. Um, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah. The creation of the stave may have perfected the stave and allowed for more precise notation of pitch, but it also continued in a trend of hindering rhythm, oral transmission, and the overall manner of singing from the heart. Uh, all right, I don't know why this is placed in this position, but we'll go there it is. There was another side to the coin which must be taken into account. When melismas, and a melisma is just um, a long phrase of uh, m pure melody sung to one single syllable, alleluia, it's a melisma. When melismas were originally pure vocalizations, when they were transformed into syllabic chants by the addition of words, this modification changed not only the original style, but also contributed to distorting the rhythm. In effect, it resulted in the individual notes, which were often of varying duration, as seen in the original notation, ending up being all of the same length when each is pronounced as a single syllable. Don Quadin, who I'll mention next week. Um, example of that, what he means when he says uh, transforming it into syllabic chants, taking something such as um, Um, what's currently designated as Mass 2, Fons uh, Bonitatis. Um, the reason why it's called Fons Bonitatis is because of the, the simplification of the Kyrie. Kyrie. text into there to describe some feast, some theology, some something. Um, and what they did is it went from being a melisma to Kyrie fons bonitatis pater ingenite blah 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 eleison and when you put in all the words like that then all of a sudden you lose the, the varying degrees of, of rhythm, some are more important than others, and when you put the text in, now all of a sudden you're singing it according to the rhythm of those words and those syllables. And that also led to the destruction of the rhythm and the chant throughout the Middle Ages. So anyways, I think we'll leave it there and um, continue 
Next week, starting off with the period of decadence and then ending, uh, should end by uh, the, um, the whole restoration in today's period. We'll close the a prayer. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Gregory, pray, pray for us. St. Cecilia, pray, pray for us. King David, pray for us. And the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Wait, right, test what test? Do you know how have to write the test? I don't want to do that. You're supposed to remember everything. Do you have a photographic memory? Alright, well I believe now we will uh, have confidence. Compline is, um, so, speaking of which, um, in the church today we have the liturgy of the Mass, which is one form of liturgy, and then there's the liturgy of the Divine Office, which is sanctification of time. Several hours, there's seven different hours throughout the day which are designated for prayer and recitation of certain psalms throughout the day. And this is actually a continuation of the Old Testament. The Old Testament had the liturgy of the hours as well. David talks about rising sometimes during the day and once during the night, praise God. And in the Bible, it mentions the apostles and the Jews. They would go to the temple at the third hour, the ninth hour, the twelfth hour to you know, uh, sing praises, the songs of the And so that continued into the New Testament, but now the Old Testament being fulfilled, it took on a different character. And in the Sixth uh, century, no, fifth century, St. Benedict was four or five hundred. Five hundred. So, sixth century, St. Benedict, who started the Benedictine order of monks, he, um, he really kind of um, uh, established the current form of the divine office that we have today. And throughout the centuries, it had minor changes and whatnot, but he kind of assembled it in the way we currently have it today. So Compliment is the, the night prayer. I have seen the Psalms um, before going to bed. And then if you live in a monastery, you get up at like 3 or 4 in the morning to see the patterns. <laughs> yeah. So, um, get on the Sorry. I'm looking up for it. What's that? The year 480. 480. Is when he's born. Okay. So, I guess it was both 5th and 6th century. 